We covered the sufficiency of Scripture last week and two weeks before that, the general and special revelation of God's Word and his, the inspiration of the text, and today we're covering inerrancy. And so, as has been our habit, I want to open us up in a word of prayer, and this prayer comes once again from the Valley of Vision, and it's about the love of God. Let's pray. O God of love, I approach thee with encouragements derived from thy character, for I am not left to feel after thee in the darkness of my nature, nor to worship thee as the unknown God. I cannot find out thy perfections, but I know thou art good, ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy. Thou hast displayed thy wisdom, power, and goodness in all thy works, and hast revealed thy will in the scripture of truth. Thou hast caused it to be preserved, translated, published, multiplied, so that all men may possess it and find thee in it. Here I see thy greatness and thy grace, thy pity and thy love, thy mercy and thy truth, thy being in men's hearts. Through it thou hast magnified thy name and favored mankind with the gospel. Have mercy on me, for I have ungratefully received thy benefits. Little improved my privileges, made light of spiritual things, disregarded thy messages, contended with examples of the good, rebukes of conscience, admonitions of friends, leadings of providence. I deserve that thy kingdom be taken away from me. Lord, I confess my sin with feeling, lamentation, a broken heart, a contrite spirit, self-abhorrence, self-condemnation, self-despair. Give me relief by Jesus, my hope, faith in his name of Savior, forgiveness by his blood, strength by his presence, holiness by his spirit, and let me love thee with all my heart. And as Paul said in Romans 8, 1, we have no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. This past week, uh, I was with my wife and Pastor Laramie in Atlanta at the G3 conference and got, got in 11.30 last night, probably fell asleep around 12.30 and woke up at 5. So uh, if I fall asleep while preaching, someone wake me up, okay? But uh, we had a really great week uh, at G3. Uh, it was a very encouraging time in the Word. And uh, one of the men we got to hear from was a man named Dave Miller. Dave Miller, if you know who he is, you know, he's a, a guy who always preaches the Word well faithfully, but also, if you don't know this about him, he is bound to a wheelchair, and he can't use his hands, so he memorizes his sermons and memorizes the text of scripture uh, that, he, that he preaches from, and uh, it's, it was really an amazing sermon, and as he's talking about, the whole theme of the conference was on Christ, and as he's talking about Christ, he talks about the Word, which reveals Christ, and he brings up this story from the conservative resurgence, and he talks about the Broadman Bible Commentary series that came out in 1969. Maybe some of you folks who are familiar with the history of the conservative resurgence. If you're familiar with the Broadman Bible Commentary series, it was very controversial uh, and part of what sparked the conservative resurgence. Well, Roy Honeycutt is, is the guy Dave Miller mentions in his volume on Exodus. And in his commentary on Exodus, uh, he gave some different possibilities of how one might interpret the burning bush scene. And so he said, well, one, it's just that the bush was burning, and it could have been uh, from the sun, just, you know, lighting it on fire. And so what they try to do is give natural explanations. But listen to this quote from Honeycutt from the book of Exodus. He says, or such a revelation, however, may well have been mediated through a visionary experience. The visionary experience would likely have assumed its descriptive character from the cultural ideas common to the era in which Moses lived. For Moses, the bush burned with the flaming presence of the angel of the Lord. But it may have well been an inner experience, and one standing next to Moses may have seen nothing extraordinary. And what is Honeycutt's purpose? It's to cast doubt on the Word of God. It's to say that it's imaginary in Moses' mind. And what it does, it's, it's almost like Satan in the garden when he says to Eve, did God really say? And this commentary really sparked on the conservative resurgence in the battle for the Bible, as they call it, or the inerrancy of Scripture. George Eldon Ladd, in his scholarly and able book, uh, if you're interested, it's called The New Testament and Criticism, he has this to say, If the Bible is the sure word of God, does it not follow that we must have a trustworthy word from God? Not only about matters of faith and practice, but in all historical and factual questions. Thus saith the Lord means that God has spoken his sure, infallible word. A corollary of this in the minds of many Christians is that we must 
have absolute infallible answers to every question raised in the historical study of the Bible. From this perspective, the critic is the one who has surrendered the word of God for the words of men, authority for speculation, certainty for uncertainty. And this conclusion, as logical and as persuasive as it may seem, does not square with the facts of God's word. And it is the author's hope that the reader may be helped to understand that the authority of God's word is not dependent upon infallible certainty in all matters of history and criticism. Ladd is getting right to the point here. A lot of these guys cast out on God's word because they're, they're framing philosophical notions and science, scientism and scientific worldview on, to, on top of the scriptures, and they're trying to give natural explanations for this. Uh, I didn't see the movie, but I remember recalling hearing uh, a Southern Baptist uh, leader talk about this movie. But It came out with Christian Bale, the Exodus movie. I don't know if any of y'all saw that movie. I didn't see it. I can't say whether it's, um, you know, wholesome. But, yeah, it was horrible. Um, as it related to the, to the word, they, uh, from what I heard was that they tried to, the Magi, whenever Moses did a miracle, the Magi would give a naturalistic explanation for every miracle, right? And th- that you can see that kind of criticism that Honeycutt's even talking about that's placed on the text of Scripture in, in Exodus, and you see it even in modern movies. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into the infallibility and errancy of the Bible, and let's talk about it from Scripture. Let's define it. And uh, so we're going to be in Titus. We're going to jump around. But the first passage is Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So it's the introduction to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1, 1 to 3. And someone with a nice loud voice, go ahead and read those first three verses for us. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, and the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised years ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Now let's break down this passage and think about the character of God as it relates to inerrancy. Paul, he says he's a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So he serves God and he's sent by God to proclaim the gospel. It's, he says here it's for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. They, they can know the truth. You can know it. You can know the truth. You don't have to doubt. And it accords with godliness or right behavior. And, and he says, in hope of eternal life, which it goes on to describe God. Look here, which God who never lies or who cannot lie in believing in the errancy, not inerrancy, believing in the errancy of the Bible, that the Bible is filled with errors, that we can't trust whether God has spoken. That says God is a liar. That says, God, we can't fully trust you if you hold to the errancy of Scripture or that there's error in Scripture. But. The doctrine of inerrancy doesn't just come from merely a historical study of Scripture, and the historical part is obviously incredibly helpful, and I think part of just living in God's world that he made, and we should use it as a tool, apologetic tool. But it really stems from the character of God. Titus says God is a God who never lies. And so if he were to hand down his word to us and say, this is truth, this is from the Son, the word from the Father who calls himself the truth, You think God, the creator of all the universe, who upholds the universe by the word of his power, you think he's going to make a mistake in communicating to us? No. And notice how he did it. He did it through apostles, how the text keeps going. He promised this before the ages began. So this happened through the prophets and even before time began. And at the proper time, so in his timing, in his wonderful timing, he manifested his word, how? So he communicated, God communicated truth. How did he do it? It's through the preaching, which Paul says he's been entrusted. And where did this command come from? The source. This is the source of truth by the command of God, our Savior. We think of John 14, 6. Uh, John 14, 6. Many of you all know it. It says, Jesus uh, said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you think in God communicating this truth, that he made it too vague, that, hey, we don't know what we can or cannot trust. No, God is very clear. He's crystal clear. And he's so clear that he says, I am truth itself. Jesus says, I am truth itself. And if you go to John 17, 17, 
And actually, we can look at a couple verses around that as well. John 17, 17. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. John 17, 17. He says, Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for, for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So God has a plan for his truth, not only just to be testified and to be known, but to be delivered and carried out through all the earth. And so what the attack on the inerrancy of Scripture did in the 20th century is it cast a lot of doubt on God's word. And you know what that does? Look at a lot of our uh, mainline denominations today. The ones who didn't win the battle over inerrancy, they've all gone very progressive and liberal today. Because if we don't know if we've heard from God, well, who becomes the authority? Because if we're declaring that God's not been clear, I become the authority. You become the authority, right? We end up being the ones who say what truth is. There's a lot of danger in that, of course, because it's like the book of Judges. There was no king in Israel, so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so when we say there's no king who's spoken clearly in his word, what do we do? We do what is right with our own eyes. It's abominable. It's, it's destructive for us. And so when Jesus prays, he wants us to be set apart for him, and it's in truth. We're set apart in God's truth. His word is truth. Just turning back a couple pages to John 15, when he tells us to abide in him. Notice what he says in abiding in him. And go down to verse 7. If you abide in me, in my words, right there, in my words, abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. We must abide in Christ, and his word must abide in us. It, it brings to mind Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse, verse 9. My word, thy word I have hidden in your heart, that I may not sin against thee. We hide God's word in our heart, that we may not sin against him. Uh, maybe if, if, as we have reflected on the word these past few weeks, and you think about your own time in the word, and, and you think about, you know, we, we talk about the glorious beauty of God's word, and the truthfulness and the goodness of God's word, but maybe your time in the word hasn't been sweet. It hasn't been like the sweetness of the honeycomb like we talked about in Psalm 19. Let me encourage you, take the next 28 days and read eight verses a day out of Psalm 119. Eight verses a day. And meditate on those passages. Because Psalm 119 is a beautiful psalm about the word. It's the longest psalm that we have, 175 verses. And let me encourage you in that way. Let God's word abide in you. And then 1 John 5. Let's go to 1 John 5. Sorry, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Someone read that for us, nice and loud. And this is the message which we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. We see that really clearly. This is a message that came from God, so we heard it from him. It was heard crystal clear. And now they proclaim it, and that's that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And that darkness has to do with the moral quality of who God is. God is not immoral at all. There's no darkness that can be found in him. He is light. And so we, we, we think about this, and we think about who God is. In that case, if the inerrancy of Scripture is false, and Scripture does have error, then there is darkness in God. Because that means God has not communicated clearly to us. That means he's not able to do something. There's, there's fault in God, but light is pure. Light is beautiful, and it's powerful. And God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God can communicate clearly, and even the word light is used often in Scripture, and even in John's Gospel, uh, about re revelation, revealing, and that makes sense, right? You go into a room, you can't see anything, you turn on the light switch, boom, you can see everything, right? God is light. He reveals things to us and, he, and through his word, and, and so that's able to help us. So we'll continue covering some more passages of Scripture in a moment. I want to define infallibility and inerrancy from you. I got these from DefendingInerrancy.com, and I actually have a book, which they produced as well, Defending Inerrancy. Uh, excellent book. It's Affirming the Accuracy of Scripture for a New Generation by Norm Geisler and William Roach. Uh, and I want to encourage you. There's a forward by J.I. Packer. Excellent book. Highly recommend it to you guys. came out, I think, 10 years ago. So Defending Inerrancy. They define infallibility, uh, which is the other thing we're talking about today as well, is this. Infallibility speaks to the authority and enduring nature of the Bible. The authority and enduring nature of the Bible. Uh, to be infallible 
means that something is incapable of failing and therefore is permanently binding and cannot be broken. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, 23 through 25, can someone read that? 1 Peter chapter 1, 23 to 25. This is one of our proof texts for infallibility. Whoever gets it, just go ahead and read it. 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25. Because you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that has been proclaimed to you. Huh. The word of the Lord endures forever. It doesn't fail. God's word doesn't fail. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures how long? Forever. So, therefore, it's authority. It cannot be broken. They continue in, in this addressing infallibility here. They say, when addressing a difficult passage, Jesus said, and we don't have to turn here, but in John 10, 34 and 35, he said, the scripture cannot be broken. Not, it might not be broken. No, it cannot be broken. And in fact, he also said in, in Matthew 5, 18, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. Those are the smallest marks you can make in writing. That, those won't even pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. These speak to the Bible's infa infallibility. It cannot fail. It cannot be broken. It endures forever. That's infallibility. Inerrancy simply means that the Bible is without error. And when we talk about inerrancy, it's that the Bible is without error in its original autograph. So what does that mean? In the original Greek text. So we do have manuscripts that have been handed down for a long time. And if you listen to people who are skeptics who don't believe in the Bible, they'll say, oh, there's been so many variations of the Bible. Now, they exaggerate their claim, and they also state it falsely. There are a lot of variants in Greek texts. We have so many New Testament Greek texts. Let's, com let's do a comparison here. And the youth have heard that me say this a ton of times, so for you guys who are in here, sorry. But um, of all ancient Greek documents, if we were to stack them all up on top of each other, like paper, you know, and just stack them on top of each other, flat, it would make about four feet tall. Of all ancient Greek documents we still have. You know, you know what we have in comparison with the Bible? A mile high of, of manuscripts, of evidence. So with the more evidence we have, the more manuscripts, we can all sit down and we can just compare each one. We could see the similarities and differences. Now, some people might be like, differences? <gasps> Does that mean there's error in the Bible? Well, no, because they're copied, right? They didn't have Xerox where it's like, hey, just to throw it on the copier. All right, we got the next manuscript. Right? No, they had to write it. They had to handwrite it. And in handwriting it, um, it might be late at night. They might have been late at night like me. They might have come back from a G3 conference from over in uh, Turkey somewhere. And they're real tired. And you're like, you know, I need to finish my manuscript. You know, I said, man, I'm, I'm behind on this. I need to finish my manuscript for tonight. I'm going to, you know, burn the midnight oil, literally. And I'm going to continue writing this. And he might fall asleep and have written the wrong letter, right? And, but he keeps writing. He doesn't check his work. Well, the scribe, you know, a generation later is like, hey, this is a guy's, hey, he, he messed up here. Oh, it looks like he fell asleep. His pen's kind of sliding here a little bit, right? So we can see there's obvious reasons where they might have made an error in their, transla not translation, but of copying. But you know how we can test that? We have so many copies that it's easy to say that's obviously not the original. It's just a, it's a mistake he made, but that doesn't any, in any way put error on the text of Scripture itself. It's just a transmission. Uh, so, some people as well, they, they might have spelled a word wrong. You see misspelled Greek words or misspelled Hebrew words. And the way you test it is you look at other people who spelled it right. So for all of us who are bad spellers sometimes, can I get an amen, right? We, uh, we can sympathize with those people, right? And like, oh, yeah, I might have misspelled that word. Um, but we have so many copies, a mile high of copies. And that's just the New Testament. If you add the Old Testament to it, uh, the Old Testament's 2.5 miles high. So you add those together, it's, it's just amazing how many um, manuscript evidences we have. So, the inerrancy of Scripture. The Bible is without error in its original autographs. It is a belief in the total truthfulness and reliability of God's words, as quoted from Grudem, uh, his systematic theology. Uh, like we said in John 17, 17, Jesus said, your word is truth. So this, this inerrancy isn't just in passages. It's a, it's the light came on, right? It's great. Um, in passages that speak about salvation, but also applies to all historical and scientific statements as well. And it is not only accurate in matters related to faith and practice, 
but it is accurate and without error regarding any statement, period. Any statement, period. So we're going to read a couple more verses here and talk about inerrancy. Um, and kind of reiterating further that God cannot lie. Can someone read for me Hebrews 6.18 and someone else James 1.17? So Hebrews 6.18 and then James 1.17. First person to Hebrews 6.18, go ahead and start reading. Nice and loud. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. We have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. It's impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. What a powerful verse when you think about every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights. You think about that verse. And what a gift we have in the Bible, in God's Word. Every good gift and perfect gift comes from above. God is the source, and God's not going to lie. He's not going to make a mistake. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.33. Could someone read that for me? First person there, just go and read it out. 1 Corinthians 14.33. This, this talks about how inerrancy means that God cannot contradict himself. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As with all the churches of the saints. Hmm. God is not a God of disorder. And now the, ne the next one here, uh, Numbers 23.19. If anyone would like to read that, Numbers 23.19. The inerrancy here means that God cannot be mistaken. God doesn't make mistakes. Inerrancy cannot, means that God cannot be mistaken. Numbers 23.19. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Hmm. He's not like us. He's greater than us. He cannot be mistaken. So, um, here are a few reasons why it's important. We already covered uh, the first one, which I have really strongly tried to emphasize, um, just if you're trying to summarize why this doctrine is important to know. Number one, the character of God, right? God did not lie. He's truthful. So that's number one. Um, it's based on God's character, why inerrancy is important. Number two, it was taught by Christ and the apostles. They taught that God's word is true, that there's no error, that it endures forever, right? It's taught by Christ and the apostles. B.B. Uh, Warfield, if you're not familiar with him, he's Presbyterian, uh, wrote a book, I think it's called Authority and Inspiration. Um, he was part of... Uh, J. Gresham Machen's group in the early uh, 20th century. And before the term inerrancy was coined, pretty much argued for inerrancy. Uh, this is what he said. We believe this doctrine of the plenary inspiration of the scriptures, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, we, we believe this doctrine of plenary inspiration of the scriptures primarily because it is the doctrine which Christ and the apostles believed and which they have taught us. And we referenced a couple of those verses earlier, right? Uh, Matthew 5.18, about the, the law. Number three, it's the historic position of the church. So the Hansen brothers, uh, Anthony and Richard, they're Anglican scholars, they said this about the position of the church on the scriptures. Listen to this quote. The Christian fathers in the medieval tradition continued this belief, so talking about inerrancy, and the Reformation did nothing to weaken it. On the contrary, since for many Reformed theologians, the authority of the Bible took the place which the Pope had held in the medieval scheme of things, the inerrancy of the Bible became more firmly maintained and explicitly defined among some Reformed theologians than it had even been before. They added, the beliefs here denied, uh, inerrancy, have been held by all Christians from the very beginning until about 150 years ago. So what he's saying is that there's people, they're saying people have been denying inerrancy. But the denials of inerrancy didn't start thousands of years ago or a couple thousand years ago. It started 150 years ago. And what does that correspond with? The rise of, the, you could say, the Enlightenment, or, and that was already there, but is kind of getting full steam ahead with rationalism and um, logical po positivism and different things like that, scientism really on a rise. And so really the past 150 years is where we've seen this big doubt on inerrancy within Christianity, and there's a reason why. No, we've got to know the history of ideas there. And then number four... Um, of why inerrancy is important, not just because it's uh, 
for, based on the character of God, taught by Christ and the apostles, and it's the historic position of the church, it's fundamental to all other doctrines. You've got to understand, the Word of God's our foundation. We sing that hymn, How Firm a Foundation, right? And, and the Word of God, is, it's, so, it's such a powerful foundation for us. Uh, Ephesians 2.20 says that, um, that the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And that's a reference to the Old and New Testament, the Word of God. So it's our foundation. If you deny the inerrancy of Scripture that God has communicated to us in his word accurately, it has the domino effect of causing doubt in all other doctrines. If God has not spoken clearly in his word, how do I know I'm a sinner? If God has not spoken clearly in his word, how do I know I can be saved? If God has not spoken clearly in his word, how can I know I can have eternal life? We must know that the word of God is our foundation. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. It's a very popular uh, statement. Um, I think all six of our Southern Baptist seminaries, um, they have to sign off on it. They, they say they, they affirm it. Many of them were part of writing it, or some, some, some guys that are part of it now were part of writing it. Um, it's, it's kind of a long affirmation, uh, but you know what? I, I've gone quite fast, so I think I have time to talk about this affirmation a little bit more in detail. But I'll try to go slow, so I'm not going too fast. Okay. Um, so in this Chicago Biblical Statement on Aaron C., which is also in this book, they have a lot of stuff on it, there's a short statement introducing the articles of affirmation and denial. And I want to read these five statements to you. Um, and I think it will help kind of round out the importance of this discussion on Aaron C., where these pastors and scholars from all over the country came up with this. Number one, God, who is himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture in order thereby to reveal himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as creator and Lord, redeemer and judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness to himself. Number two, Holy Scripture being God's own word, written by men, prepared and superintended by his spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. Number three, the Holy Spirit, Scripture's divine author, both authenticates it to us by his inward witness and opens our minds to understanding its meaning. Number four, being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching. No less in what it states about God's acts in creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God than, it, than in its witness to God's saving grace in, in individual lives. And number five, the last one, the authority of Scripture is inescapably impaired if this total divine inerrancy is in any way limited or disregarded or made relative to a view of truth contrary to the Bible's own, and such lapses bring serious loss to both the individual and the church. I think that's very profound in just thinking about the role of inerrancy in the life of the Christian and the believer and the infallibility of the word. I want to encourage you, uh, maybe today, as in some reflection on a Sunday school lesson, go read the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy. It gets in a lot more detail, and I think it's very helpful. Uh, there's about 19 articles to it, um, so I, I won't read them all right now. Um, but in application, and we, we'll I'll allow for some talk back time as well, uh, recently, Tom Askell from Founders Ministries in Cape Coral, Florida, he came out with this excellent article called Theoretical Inerrancy. And it was in part an indictment over the current issues in the Southern Baptist Convention. But it's, it's ex an excellent um, article. I want to encourage you to read it. But I, I want to read something he said in there, uh, which was just really profound. What good, what good is an inerrant Bible if you refuse to read and heed it? Who cares if a person has signed 10,000 affirmations, like the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy or, and Orthodoxy, if he does not seek to order his life according to the plain teaching of Scripture? We can have all the theoretical stuff in our head if we want, but if we're not practicing it, we're hypocrites. What difference does your affirmation of inerrancy make if, and here's some bullet points, what difference does your affirmation of inerrancy make if you endorse a conference that promotes gay Christianity? If you bring godless entertainment into your services of gathered worship of the triune God. If you cover up the abuse of victims in your church or institution. If you are content to have half or more of your church members never even attend gathered worship. 
if you refuse to lead your church to obey Jesus' words in Matthew 18, 15 to 18. If you refuse to repent honestly and straightforwardly over sin and choose rather to offer half-hearted apologies or excuses that attempt to cloud over or mitigate your offense. What good is the doctrine of inerrancy if you hesitate or even refuse plainly to call sin what the Bible calls sin? If you advocate as righteousness what the Bible does not call righteous. If you imbibe ideologies that are not according to Christ rather than exposing and contending against them. And if you refuse to embrace your God-given role in the family, church, and state. He goes on here and says, Theoretical inerrancy is killing the church in America. It is spreading like stage four cancer, and only God can stop it. If he does, it will be through how? The spirit-empowered preaching and teaching of his word. If he does, there will be deep repentance among pastors, leaders, and churches where sin is confessed, new resolve is given, and new patterns of living and ministering are embraced. This is why we wanted to make this big change in our Sunday school curriculum, in part because some of the things we mentioned before, some of the things that were coming in from curriculums that were either weakening the word or assaults on the word. We wanted to say as staff and even for our Sunday school teachers joining us in this and, and say this is the church body, as the leaders of this church, that the word of God is essential and we want to proclaim the word and we want to invest it in our families and our families to be connected on this point that we might all grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want it to just be a theory in our minds, and for some it will be at times, and for some of us, right, we understand we don't practice as much as we know. Why? Because we're sinners, but that's why we have the body of Christ, and we spur each other on to love and good works. That's why, as it says in Hebrews chapter 10, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Verses 23 to 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And what causes waver? Doubt in who God is and his word. That's what causes wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He doesn't lie. He tells the truth. And let us, the body of Christ right here, let us consider how. So we've got to think how we're going to do this. How to stir one another up to love and good works. We've got to live it out. It can't be theoretical. Not neglecting. To meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. we got to build each other up. we got to help each other. Why? Because there are some of, among us who are faint-hearted, some among us who are weak. And if we're all honest, at some points in our life, we all get there. Everyone. No matter how long you've been walking with Christ, we have to consider, we have to give thought to and think about how we, I can say, how can I help you love Christ better? How can I help you do good works better? We have to think about that. We, and, and if we're not meeting together, if we neglect that, we can't do it. We have to encourage one another. And notice this, it's eschatological here, meaning it's looking toward the end. And all the more as you see the day, capital D, as you see the day drawn near. Why? Because as Scripture says, we, we're going to give an account. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the Bema seat. That's the seat of rewards. And we're going to be judged whether the good or the bad that we do in the body. And what are you doing? What are you doing? What am I doing? We have to think about these things. We have to self-assess ourselves all the time and think, what am I holding to just in my mind? And what am I practicing? And the best way to do that is being close to the Word of God and close to one another. We have to be close to each other. We have to be honest with each other. And we have to be Bold enough to say, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. I'm going to tell you, this is what the Word says. And what the Word says here, because it's truthful, it's from God. And we tell them that. Lord willing, they respond in confession and repentance. And they, in, in, in they, like Proverbs says, the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. He gets back up again. We don't want to neglect to meet together. We see that the day is drawing near. I had the privilege of uh, being at G3 to uh, see James Coates. If you don't know who James Coates is, uh, he is a pastor in Canada, Grace Life Church, who was thrown in jail for a month because he continued to have church against the governor's or the, the nation's orders uh, from the communist nation of Canada. Uh, and so now I'm really excited to hear uh, the word of God preached this morning from, from Pastor Lewis. And even just reflecting on James Coates' situation, I'm grateful that we live in the nation that we do. But our nation is turning on bad and worse times. 
There are always threats against God's church. When we think about the persecuted church in Afghanistan and the Christians who lost their lives, they lost their lives trying to get out. Many, some, we got some out. But there are people who are dying around the world who don't have the gospel. I remember one time I was in chapel at Southwestern and I was in a kind of difficult time in my life. And I remember seeing on the screen, they played this video of this tribal missions and these missionaries had led this entire tribe to Christ and they translated the whole New Testament. And when the plane landed, they had a pallet of Bibles. They were dancing. They were singing. And as they saw the word of God and how it, they longed for it and they had, they're they saying these are the words of eternal life and we have them written. And they were handing out Bibles and dancing and singing. They were so joyful over the word. And listen, listen to this, this psalm that the, the man, he prayed this psalm in the group. Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Psalm 126, a song of ascents. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth, mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. And then, and then he started weeping as he started saying this part. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. They longed for the word. They wept over not having the word. And even recognizing lost in their sin, that they, they wept because of their sin and the destruction of sin in their life. But when they heard the gospel and it changed their lives, what did it do? Yes, they sowed in tears, and even those missionaries who came sowed in tears with the difficulties, but they reaped with shouts of joy when the seeds were planted and the gospel grew and lives were changed. I think of Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6. Starting in verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Listen very closely here. Do not be deceived. In other words, you could be deceived. Look out. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. What are you sowing? What am I sowing? Hopefully it's not theoretical inerrancy. Hopefully it's not, I got all my doctrine straight. Guess what? Demons got their doctrine straight too. You know that? James 2.19, you believe God is one. Good. You do well. The demons believe that. And they tremble. They tremble. So how do we respond to the word? Don't let it be theoretical. Internalize the word. Let it change you. Because from the spirit, you'll reap eternal life. And we recognize, right? The spirit of God is the author of scripture. He carried along the apostles as they wrote. He... God breathed the scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God, and it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So, brothers, sisters, I want to encourage you, as Paul does in Galatians 6, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Don't give up. Keep fighting the good fight. Run the race well. Work like the hardworking farmer. We need the Word of God. <coughs> As we think about it, just in closing, I want to I read this quote from G.I. Packer. It's from 1958 in his book, Fundamentalism and the Word of God. You use that word fundamentalism today, and it's kind of like the bad word of the media, right? Oh, they're a fundamentalist. Well, I hope we're all fundamentalists as it relates to gravity, right? I believe in the fundamental reality. Gravity's real, you know? So that's a basic, that means it's basic, you know? So... Uh, I'm not going to go jump off a building because I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm a fundamentalist as it relates to that. Okay. So fundamentalism just has to do with the basics, the, set, the essentials, right? So fundamentalism in the Word of God, he wrote this in order to contend for the basic authority of Scripture against those who argued that the fundamentalists were mistaken in their approach to the subject. What he wrote then could not be more important and relevant for evangelicals today. And Tom Ask also shared this quote in his article that I mentioned. Here it is, G.I. Packer. 
We have to choose whether we will accept the biblical doctrine of Scripture as it stands or permit ourselves to refashion it according to our fancy. We have to choose whether to embrace the delusion that human creatures are competent to judge and find fault with the words of their creator, or whether to recognize this idea for the blasphemy that it is and drop it. We have to decide whether to carry through our repentance on the intellectual level or whether we shall still cherish our sinful craving for a thought life free from the rule of God. We have to decide whether to say that we believe the Bible and mean it, or to say it for look and look for ways whereby we can say it without having to accept all the consequences. If the human mind is set up as the measure and test of truth, it will quickly substitute for man's incomprehensible creator a comprehensible idol fashioned in man's own image. Man wants a God he can manage and feel comfortable with and will inevitably invent one if allowed. He will forget, because he cannot understand, the infinite gulf that separates the Creator from his creatures and will picture to himself a God wholly involved in this world and wholly comprehensible in principle at any rate by the speculative intellect. It was no accident, but a natural development that made the liberal theology of the 19th century so strongly pantheistic. Once people reverse the proper relationship between Scripture and their own thinking and start judging biblical statements about God by their private ideas about God instead of vice versa, the knowledge, their knowledge of the Creator is an imminent danger of perishing, and with it, the whole idea of supernatural religion. That's the danger of denying inerrancy. The da danger of denying inerrancy is that you become your own God. You decide what is right or wrong. The media and the left have made use of the term fundamentalist as a pejorative and an insult. But I would like to say, I don't care what they think. And you shouldn't either. We should say, yes, we are fundamentalists and that we believe in the fundamental scriptures, the basics, the essentials. Let's live up to that name. Let's live up to the fact that the first principles and the foundation of our faith is not only what drives our minds and our hearts, but our hands and our feet. Let's be driven by the word. That's all I have on uh, the inerrancy of scripture for this morning. But I did want to make an opportunity for you guys, if you had questions about inerrancy, I could try and answer some of those questions. I didn't, obviously, I can't cover everything. That's why they write books. But if anyone had questions for clarification, I would love to answer some questions. Or if there are comments that anyone would like to make about uh, this or share anything from the Word or uh, anything else. Yes, Rob. So, Travis, I'd just like to say I'm so thankful to have pastors who want to drive home the importance of this subject matter. And take seriously the uh, week in and week out teaching in our Sunday school classes, wanting to provide for us teachers and leaders in the church body that uh, hold, these, hold this as a convictional truth and are unwavering in it, are willing to pound the pulpit to declare the truth of it, and to hold it before us as the, the foundation that we should stand upon and call us to it. Hmm. That's, that's, that's a righteous, godly, uh, endeavor and I'm thankful for it and I just want to say thank you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's a joy to serve here at Woodlawn and serve with Lewis and Laramie, some of my greatest friends and encouragers. And uh, you guys as well are very encouraging in your responses as well. So thank you for that, Rob. Any other comments? Oh, yeah. From a societal point of view, though, you know, we're considered to see more uh, intolerant and uh, you know, in this new woke and enlightened society, you know, that we are uh, supposed to be in now, why yeah. can't we make some uh, concessions or whatever from our position that we hold so important? Yeah. So you're asking a question about, no. oh, 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 sorry, 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 okay, yeah, I get what you're saying. I get, I get, yeah, 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 no problem. <laughs> sorry. That's good. All right. Any other comments or, or questions or anything? Okay. All right. Well, let me close us in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time to study uh, this, this topic on inerrancy. 
uh, this topic about your word. We thank you that your word is the center and foundation of our lives. And I know each of us in the sanctification process, you have us in. The, we're, we're being built up brick by brick. You are constructing us to, to look more like your son, to take us away from our flesh that's old and passed away, and, and to allow us to grow into this new man. You've made us new in Christ. And daily it's a battle to not sow to the flesh, but to sow to the Spirit. Because from the Spirit we will reap eternal life. So, God, I pray that you help each of us to do that. That we would, do, we would live in such a way that we hate what you hate. That we, we, we hate any sin which might cling so close to us. We might run this race with endurance, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and he despised the shame and he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We look to him, our prophet, our priest, our king. And we worship him because of who he is and what he has done. We thank you that you have clearly communicated who you are and what you have done through your word so that we could be saved, so that we could be made right with you, and so that we can look forward to that day when you come again in your glory. We pray this in the name above every name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.